This is what happens when you have a panel of guys who know each other. Yeah, I know. For a couple years, and so met ten years. So, <laughs> Robert Levitt. Yeah, he was a coach. Oh, where'd you go? We, are good we have got a crowd. Cool. I didn't mean to scare you off. Stick around. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Schulman. I am of Mission Cyber LLC, but as I introduce our other panelists here, or our panelists, uh, we represent FCA International today. So we will get to that here in a second. But welcome to arguably the most challenging event of the day after the, the dessert um, event. So hopefully the sugar rush doesn't hit you guys too much, but we will keep you awake because this is going to be a fascinating Zero Trust panel. Um, and which is not Thunderdome, by the way. So if you're looking for Thunderdome, you're in the wrong spot. This is beyond yeah. Thunderdome. Yes, <laughs> yes, we are beyond, yes. Thunderdome's not there yet. All right. So uh, as I mentioned, my name is Dan Schulman. Uh, I am a member of the FCA Homeland Security Committee and a member of the Zero Trust Strategies Subcommittee. Um, and I am joined today with some of our other committee members, which I'll introduce here in a second. Uh, we do represent, again, FCA, uh, uh, not our specific uh, industry organizations per se, or in Bill's case, federal. Uh, we are uh, comprised of the FCA Cyber Committee, the Homeland Security Committee, the FCA Technology Committee, and uh, the FCA Intelligence Committee. Um, so before I get to introductions really quickly, this is trying to make this a little taller here. All right. Uh, this is the uh, FCA Cyber here now in the future of Zero Trust. Zero Trust, I'm sure everybody in the audience has heard this term by now. Uh, it means different things to different people, certainly different vendors. Uh, we, as the subcommittee, uh, have consistent meetings on it. We have uh, guest speakers. Uh, we just had Sean Connolly from CISA come by the other day virtually, of course, and he gave one of the best analogies that I've heard so far, and that is that Zero Trust comparing it to a baseball stadium, which is perfect timing considering tonight's game two, World Series. Uh, whether you are at Nationals Park or, or Camden Yards, you have different baseball stadiums, right? The old way of doing things, you get your ticket, you walk in the gate, Ticket is scanned, and then you have free reign to go wherever you like within that stadium. You can go to your seat. You can get into a conflict with somebody if you're in the wrong seat. You can go get a beer. You can go get a piece of slice of pizza. You are free to do whatever you would like inside that baseball stadium. Zero trust changes that. Zero trust, you have to prove your ticket, prove your identity at the gate. Then you have to do it again to get a beer. Then you have to do it again to get a seat. Then you have to do it again to go change levels in the stadium. So, um, and I'll throw this over to uh, James later too, because he has an even better zombie analogy, I do believe. Um, but that is what, you know, we on the strategies uh, subcommittee come up with ways to help relate this, how to drive culture and help drive this change because zero trust is, is in no way easy and there's no way a one size fits all uh, solution. All right, so with that, I'm going to go slightly out of order here because I want to start with Glenn first. Glenn is our chair. Glenn Hernandez uh, chairs the FCA Zero Trust Strategies Subcommittee. He previously served as the U.S. Coast Guard CISO and is a frequent judge on cybersecurity TV's Shark Tank. I have seen him there. Um, and supports many FCA education and workforce development activities. He is a credentialed ISC Squared Certified Information System Security Professional and a GAC Global Industrial Cybersecurity Professional. Uh, and then let's go here with John. John Dvorak is an emerging technology specialist at Red Hat and a cybersecurity evangelist. He is former FBI security executive and has spent over 13 years as an industry CTO and CIO. And in addition to being the lead for the upcoming ZTS uh, subcommittee, the Signal Magazine blog series, he's also an active member of the FCA Technology Committee. James. All right. Dr. James Stanger is Comptia's chief technology evangelist and He's doing a boot camp tomorrow, correct? Who's that? You're doing a boot camp tomorrow? Here oh, I'm doing a boot camp tomorrow, that's right. right. Yeah, okay. on, uh, pen testing in the cloud. Okay, so he's a technical guy. We all are. Uh, and they recognize authority in security, information technology, and open source. He consults regularly with organizations such as Northrop Grumman, AstraZeneca, West Point, Dark Trace, 
University of Cambridge and Zscaler as a, uh, as a build of security capability. Now, the last sentence that he has in his introduction, I will say, is probably one of the best I have read. And so if you're already wondering what this is about. Um, James has also helped design educational programs and topics as diverse as security analytics, Linux, kayaking, and British romantic literature. It's true. All right, so if you really take that out of context, it makes it very interesting, yeah. very, very interesting uh, bio. Bridgerton. And then we have Mr. Bill Newhouse, cybersecurity engineer at the NIST and CCOE, which is the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence up in uh, Rockville. His work pushes for the adoption of collaborative work to demonstrate cybersecurity implementations focused on cybersecurity risk in the hospitality, retail, and federal sectors. Pretty busy guy. These projects, which rely on the members of these sectors, aim to demonstrate that commercially available technologies can effectively address cyber risk. His future NCCOE uh, focus areas include financial service sector and maritime transportation services sector. So with that, gentlemen, welcome to, the, uh, to this panel here. We're going to have an interesting conversation. And for the audience, you will see some of the topics and strategies that we discuss on some of our internal meetings. All right. So topic number one, and you know, a lot of these panels, I'm sure everybody has attended, but usually when you get towards the end, start throwing questions out for everybody, uh, not a specific, uh, specific person. Well, we're going to do that now, right? So I'm going to do this for the whole group, very first topic area, because it is rather broad. But I will ask Glenn if he can kick us off. Yeah. Uh, we have discussed internally the strategy, policy, and culture for zero trust. Can you highlight some examples of this policy strategy and some positive aspects of creating and implementing zero trust. Absolutely, so thank you all for joining us. Hopefully you can hear me well. We're competing with a lot of uh, noise in the back and in the uh, stadium or the arena here. But uh, it's certainly a privilege to be in person. It's been a while uh, since having the opportunity to speak to uh, folks, especially on the subcommittee. So, uh, so thank you for coming. Obviously, uh, the topic has been near and dear to me uh, because as serving on the cyber committee, and there's several committees within AFSIA that try to look at different topics, uh, like Dan mentioned, but in this particular area, I saw this as a, a cross-cutting issue or concept that transcends, really, the different areas that AFSIA looked at, whether it was small business, technology, intel, or even cyber, because for me, having come from the Coast Guard, you really couldn't accomplish change if you really had buy-in from leadership and implemented policy and had an approach to changing culture. Because when you think about, at least in my terms of zero trust, it's a mindset that you have to approach. How are you going to prioritize your resources to really invest on what you're going to protect the most? Because at least from my experience in Coast Guard, we're having scarce resources. I could not protect everything. And nor could I get the organization to really be with the commandant if we didn't have that leadership from the top. And so coming up with a strategy is, was our initial approach to changing culture within the Coast Guard. So in 2015, after the OPM hack, right, where we had to go through the cyber sprint, the only way we could really get buy-in from the entire organization was putting out a strategy from the commandant that says, these are the steps that we're gonna take strategically to change the culture within the organization, to understand how we're going to operate securely, but else, also prioritize what resources in the future we need to do. And this is not near term, this is long term. And so with that mindset uh, put in place, now you can start training the organization to build the skill sets that you need to work on technology, work on the people, policies and procedures, work on the components to implement a security strategy. So that's how I see it in terms of people and culture to change uh, the mindset of zero trust. And, and so it was my privilege to start the subcommittee that was cross-cutting with uh, lots of volunteers and industry and having government uh, like uh, Mr. Carone uh, from HSS really add to the lexicon so that we can have a common understanding instead of, you know, not, not to uh, denigrate what's happening on the floor, but there is a lot of zero trust talk, but it would be helpful 
with things like the 800-207 uh, that was published by NIST to start the conversation. You have NSA coming out with the ZTA model, and then you have CISA recently coming out with their uh, maturity model and other doc documents. So there's lots of things that are helping the lexicon, but you can't further it without conversation and happy to carry more with the audience. Great. Thank you, Glenn. And we'd like to add anything, John? I think you had a couple of uh, pieces on, uh, just, on Just to reiterate, I think one of the main things it did is it kind of changed the thing from security topic du jour, right, into a more strategic conversation. That's one thing we noticed at CompTIA. You could use the buzz phrase strategic IT, but the idea that instead of asking for money as a CISO or whatever, you're now engaged in a strategic kind of governance, compliance-oriented type of discussion, a policy-based discussion. Yeah, and if you went back to the, the Kindervog talk about Project Jericho, which was at the beginning, it was all about the organizational objectives, right? Why is your organization existing? And focusing on that first, what is your mission? And then working your way back on how we're going to satisfy that mission, but securely. And, and that's why the thought behind Zero Trust isn't just recent. It's been around for a long time and it's just recently that folks are starting to understand the concepts and the technologies that can enable it. Excellent, thank you guys both. Um, next topic area, next question, and John, this one is for you if you'll lead us off. Sure. Uh, and this is the level of depth that we do talk about on, the, on, this, uh, on this subcommittee. Section four of the OMB Federal Trust Strategy for Applications states, and I quote, Agencies must identify at least one internal facing FISMA moderate application and make it accessible over the public internet using enterprise SSO or single sign-on. So John, this is a, a eye-opening statement to many people. So what is, what is this all about? Can you tell me about it? Yeah, so if you read the rest of the document, um, most of you will find it's, it's very high level. And then suddenly you go extraordinarily specific with this request and it's like, where did this come from? So the first read for a lot of us, um, we've had, we have uh, the uh, uh, the benefit of having talked to the writers since then <laughs> too to get some clarity. But when you first read it, it's like, wow, that's oddly specific. Why why are we calling out FISMA systems? And for those, I think every most of the audience should should know uh, what a FISMA system is. But you know, um, it, it, this is a system that's well documented, uh, that's presented to government. It's a system that's 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 got a uh, rating that's determined uh, by the government, um, and it's, and it's and again, it's, it's well documented. So why does this, why would you, like you're on your first run out and, and this is going to be our metric, let's, let's have a, a very important system that has a lot of criticality. Well, as we all know, and many of us have been through I, IT modernization efforts across government, we've, uh, I'm a, a former Fed and I've, I've been through quite a few myself, is if you leave it to an agency to decide, you know, what they're going to use as their their standard, um, you know, I'm going to go to uh, uh, Bill's blog on, on this, and I'll be like, okay, this is our system that we're going to we're going to put up and, and write our, uh, uh, you know, do our transition and, and say, yay, we we won. So it, at some point, you've got to make a you've got to make a commitment, and I think um, this it, it's a forcing function across government. There's got to be some kind of standard that we're going to apply across civilian and and uh, DoD agencies. Uh, that w that we can look and say, okay, yeah, you did, you, you know how to do this. Uh, therefore, you know, continue. Um, so, you know, to me, when I read that, and I think, and again, what the authors meant by this is like, this is serious. Take it serious. We want a serious uh, commitment and a serious system um, uh, to be, you know, what we're going to use as our metric. Um, and so it does make sense. Um, now, in terms of the way it's written today, I mean, this is this is John speaking now a little bit of, um, it, it's sort of a, if you have a system today that in, and it's, you know, pick this system that's very important, it's behind your firewalls today, it's behind your macro perimeter, um, make that be the one that you put on the outside of, of the macro perimeter, the network perimeter, and um, prove that you can implement zero trust and it's, it's, it's safer, better than it is today. There's plenty of systems and I think this will change as we get more clarity. There's plenty of systems today that are already visible to the outside uh, that, that are FISMA systems, FISMA rated systems that are government um, with, with external uh, visibility that could also be targets for this, this, uh, for this same requirement. Um, so I, I suspect, and, and we've all fed back our, our feedback here, uh, additional 
iterations of the documentation may be a little bit looser about, you know, it must, our, it must be a system that's kind of hidden away and now it's going to be visible. Uh, I think there's plenty of systems we can work with that are, um, that are visible today that, that, could, that could use some zero trust. Yeah, absolutely. So just to reiterate, uh, it does not mean, correct John, that just go ahead and pick something. Go ahead and pick your, your decade old copy of uh, Hyperion and throw it on the internet. Right? This is a calculated uh, organizational decision of what kind of application to, to, to put open. Yeah, it to needs the to be yeah, it needs to be something significant and the only thing that we have in common across agencies and the government today is FISMA ratings and FISMA system standards and that, that sort of registered and, and largely um, respected the same way across agencies. But and then I'll, I'll, I'll point this out too. There, there are plenty of systems that are rated as FISMA systems within the government that are not really good candidates for this. There are plenty of systems that are, that are uh, general service systems um, networks that are, that are FISMA rated because they have systems running on top of them. Uh, they don't really have anybody logging into that. I mean, these are, these are infrastructure systems. So there's going to be, I think, additional clarity around. This should be something where there's users and people are logging in and, and there's some multiple levels of um, access to, to data and that sort of thing. So I think we'll see some clar clarification around that. Excellent. Thank you very much. And this is by no means a dig at Hyperion. I just happen to think about it. I don't even know if Oracle is here. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, topic number three, Bill, you're up next. Uh, we love to hear from our friends at NIST. Uh, we constantly hear that we need to protect the data. Uh, how does zero trust relate to data? And how does the NCCOE, National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, uh, approach this? Yeah. So. NIST was asked a couple of years ago by the Fed CIO Council to develop some zero trust architecture documentation to describe it, to, to, to define it, to offer, and they did. It's called NIST Special Bub 800-207, and it has tenets, the tenets of zero trust, the, the foundations that you, you think about. It has pictures of the logical components of zero trust, and it takes, it takes all those things that zero trust brings to us, which is everything we've always wanted to do, and, and gives us some, the modern language that we hope holds up as we continue the conversation. So at the center, we have two projects to apply. The center, NCCOE, is an applied cybersecurity center. We're trying to take our own best practices and guidance or international standards and put them into reference designs that, that let you see that today's technology can be enabled to, to, to show us that more cybersecurity can happen. And so in zero trust, my colleague, Alper Kerman, is leading an effort to first just get some vendors together and build the green space on which we can tackle something like enhanced identity governance as a, as a first phase project. How hard is that to implement with technologies that exist today? I bet if we bought one person's, one company's platform, that's pretty simple, but when you start to figure out the kind of legacy stuff we're going to be layering into this as we do it, the complications get, get grow. So one of the projects is just that, let's start to show people what we meant by these terms in that 800-207 and show you some realizable ex outcomes, show you some use case scenarios. One of the projects I'm working on specifically is called data classification. All the resources in Zero Trust, everything is a resource. Data, your systems, your users, everything has to be considered a resource. So you need to know all about it. And, and data classification is not new to many in this community. We've had to do it all along just to mark our data. And we've also seen all along that that has its limitations as how effective it can be, how easy it is to move that data out of my controlled area to another. So the sharing after you've done it is hard. So my data classification project will be asking vendors to bring to us the agnostic technologies that will let us start to mark and label the data. We know how to do that. But then to talk about if I need to leave my, my zero trust island to go to somebody else's zero trust island, what are the, left, what are the things, the minimum standards we need to communicate and, and offer that when you use the data, you're protecting it the way I need you to. And if I have no expectation of that, I've labeled it that it's okay you can do with that data what you need to do. So essentially, come to us if you think you want to watch somebody struggle to build something with a whole bunch of different technologies <laughs> from out there in the, in the in industry. If you already do that, come to us and tell us how good you are at doing it so we don't bother to reinvent a wheel that's already rolling down the highway. 
Um, and I think we'll learn from each other because we develop a community, we'll, we'll find little moments to share the best thing we just discovered as we go, go along. And it, it's kind of fun to be in the committee and, and Glenn's always like, Bill, tell us what NIST is doing. And we're always trying to make sure you know what we're doing and we know that making you come to our website to figure that out is not easy. So tackle me later too. But data, data is foundational. It's, it's that resource that if you don't know your data, then what, how could you even establish a trust relationship between Glenn and the data and the other customers in the data and the devices in the data? So it's, it's vital. So for the record, I missed the old time.gov, which I think was HTML based in like 2003, maybe. Yeah, you and like the new one? There. It's got I, pretty 508 it's very colors. Pretty. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, it doesn't show you the clock right away. I don't know. Yeah. This, this point. Is, I don't yep. know. But, uh, all right, thank you. And you know, Glenn, I thought we discussed, did you have something to add to this, to the data categorization? Yeah, it's not really about the data portion, but just NIST in general, from my experience, because of their focus to try to help the community, both federal and organizations, I've seen how their influence has helped international. For example, when they came out with their cybersecurity framework, and I was working with the International Maritime Organization on their cybersecurity framework. They looked at UK's, they looked at Australia's, but then they saw NIST in terms of how they were doing theirs, and they adopted their language into their, um, into their uh, resolutions because they have a credibility that's internationally known, but it also, it's also focused on helping the community. It's not vendor centric, right? It's not sometimes uh, just focused on government exclusively, but it's really helping the community. And so through their work over at NCCUE, uh, I know I learn a lot uh, just from uh, reading their documentation, but also through the community and the subcommittee, we learn from each other on how to improve the language and feed that back to NIST to, to share it with others. Well, and, and your first question was the positive aspects of Zero Trust, and, and positive is that we finally are giving people a mental model so that the expertise gets farther into the organization of expertise of worrying about stuff. You've given them a, a different language than bad stuff will happen. You just say, we need to establish this, and it sounds positive in that respect. I know it's hard, and it will continue to be hard, but I think we're now engaging more and more within the different organizations that will be asking their CISOs to lead a development of it. So that's that's the positive. And, and if you're a CISO out there, right, you might as well be a linguist because a lot of times you are the translator between the C-suite and the operational tech floors, right, to trying to decipher what the communities are talking, even on the CFO side, right, on how to translate it, that to investment. So NIST, again, is helping folks like me help in that translation so that you can get buy-in from the community and adopt the policies and cultural uh, aspects that you need in your organization to create change. I think one of the positive things too is that there's been a there's really been a kind of a maturity assessment. In other words, uh, uh, John, you mentioned it. I think you mentioned it a little bit, uh, uh, Bill. The whole idea of organizations really kind of taking a step back and using zero trust as a way to kind of go do an intervention, as it were. Is, you know, what what is the maturity of our particular approach to things? And I think that's something that's really important. Yeah, so definitely, and, and Glenn's mention of, of the CISO level, if, you know, just mentioning, because I walked by an event, uh, uh, someone speaking earlier, and this made me uh, raise my eyebrows a little bit, which they're absolutely correct. If I'm the end user, so go all the way down to the end, right? If I'm the end user and I hear things like, you have to constantly prove yourself, constantly prove your identity over and over and over again, that, that sounds horrible, right? That sounds absolutely dreadful and I want no part of that whatsoever. Because I, as an end user, not technical, I'm thinking that means a password every 10 minutes, if, if not, if, but, or worse. But uh, if pip you, card challenge, cat yeah. card challenge, et cetera. But, but if you've seen. implemented the, the cultural exchange appropriately, the expectation level at both at the end user and at the management yes. and the leadership has been set appropriately, but it takes time. It's not something that happens instantaneously. Absolutely. Well, the other thing too that happens a lot with the constant assessment that happens, it's not so much on the authentication side, it's the constant assessment of data from, to Bill's perspective, but also processes, systems as they are going. So it's, it's really kind of a constant monitoring that the average end user really is not going to be is not even going to be aware of. And that's another thing that is interesting. Instead of it being seen as a technical play, it's being seen, I think, Zero Trust as a way to uh, implement better monitoring, better observability, better contextualization that actually allows the end user, it's seamless to the end user, and I think it also allows the organization to focus on you know, what is at risk uh, rather than 
looking at, at security. So I think that's an important piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dr. Sanger, since you have the, oh. uh, you have the mic and the floor, I'll throw the next one oh, over your right. way here. Um, so let's talk about skills and skill mm. sets. Uh, what current or new skill sets are needed for zero trust administrative and technical implementation, right? Varying on the traditional that, VPN defense in depth, right? Can a, a network or security engineer, CompTIA certified, of course, uh, pivot and with, from the defense in depth to uh, zero trust? Can they do so overnight or through the process? Sure. I think one of the first things to think about is zero trust being an architecture. People will use the term model. It's certainly working its way into the, what you would call the traditional uh, uh, security job roles. So with, whether you're a cloud engineer, administrator, or data center for that matter, I don't think it, zero trust kills the data center. We live in a cloud first hybrid world, so it's working its way into job roles is one of my first answers to you. The second thing is the, the types of skills that are really important have been around for a while. If you take a look at it, you could argue it's a half a dozen or a dozen specific technical skills, whether it be involving continual monitoring, user behavior, uh, uh, evaluation, uh, the implementation of single sign-on, for example. All of those things have been around for some time. It's just a question of strategically uh, rolling it together and tactically uh, training to specific skills that fit in with that particular job role. So. Uh, I think it's going to work its way into job roles. I think it was a question we were asked uh, on an uh, interview at one point, weren't we? Uh, you know, what kind of, will there become the zero trust administrator or whatever? And yeah, my answer was, I, uh, yeah, I was certification. I would argue it's just going to work its way into the network professional school, skill set. It's right. going to work its way into the security administrator skill set. That's my, that's my perspective. It's what we see. It's still networking. It's still security. We're just a different approach, different framework. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly something that involves a lot more monitoring than ever before. And I think that's one of the keys here. I, my favorite analogy, by the way, uh, the baseball analogy is great. You can call it a concert analogy. Mine is the zombie analogy. Anybody have a favorite zombie movie? Do you have one, John? All of them. I mean, all of them? Yeah. 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 I mean, let's yeah. Walking Dead. I mean, I'm, I'm walking Dead. Yeah. Uh, not the late last season, but yeah. I sure like Twenty Eight Days Later. If you guys, oh, but anyway, whatever zombie movie you like, I think it the it profession has not seen enough zombie movies, or at least realized they've been living in a zombie movie all that times. Because one of the truisms of a zombie movie is what that your best friend, right, your trusted person, could turn south on you at any given moment, right? So you always have to be really, really aware, right? And then you have to act decisively and do the double tap when necessary, right? I honestly think that's a very important analogy to understanding what zero trust is all about. Because no perimeter, if you watch World War Z, is going to protect you, right? Uh, but constant vigilance and things can help you out. So I, micro-segmentation, I think that's a very important. We've, we've talked about segmentation in the networking world for decades, right? But micro-segmentation, I think, is something that's uh, a bit new. But it, it, it builds on that foundation. So, so going with the uh, zombie analogy, yeah. right? So what if your coworker does turn and now they're an insider threat? Yeah. You want to be able to have the policies and the technical infrastructure that's going to detect those type of behaviors, either through uh, temporal or anomalies in their behaviors on the network or on the infrastructure, so that you can have that, those flagged so that now it's not just a technology, uh, infrastructure, it's also observing the conditions that require access and having those indicators trip when that person has turned on the organization. Or, or some, some sort of Bill Murray situation where they really haven't turned but it looks like they have, right? Yeah. You know, because that happens, right? Sure. It's like somebody actually compromises your system and even though you're still a good person, a good guy or whatever, somehow one of your processes has gone rogue. So right. to the same point. But uh, still keeping to the tenets of zero trust, Right, is that constant monitoring and detection with the conditional access, uh, no implicit trust, and of course, assume breach. So NSA did, a, I think, a great job of identifying that triangle paradigm uh, to me, and, uh, and, and from my perspective, it's, it's very independent. Like Jerry Carone has discovered over at State Department, over at HSS, it's very personal in terms of how they're going to structure their own personal journey for the organization, and it's not an all-in-one solution for every organization. You really need to learn about the organization and how to protect its mission and implement a strategy that makes sense to them. Excellent, excellent stuff. All I heard was James likes Brad Pitt movies. That's, that's all I know. <laughs> oh, you're killing me, man. <laughs> All right, so uh, John, I'm going to ask you this one, but we have all discussed this, and, and it's open, uh, of course, for everybody. 
dealing with legacy implementations. This is a sizable topic because if you're on the network, they're meant to work, be on the network, right? If you're on VPN, you're on the network. Uh, while Zero Trust is a sound, modern solution, implementation is far from easy. What are some of the challenges specifically around legacy applications? And I leave it, you know, I have my own legacy applications in mind, but I leave it open to any legacy applications you can think of. Yeah, great. So this is going to sound very, anyone who's done any kind of modernization effort, um, these points or these, uh, these challenges are the same that we've, we've dealt with for you know, 20, 30 years of modernization. Uh, with, and I'll put a little bit of a, a zero trust spin on them, but, but they're the same sort of things. Um, and kind of recapping what we, we talked about already, one of the number one challenges with, with legacy uh, systems is commitment and, and uh, uh, commitment to change. And so this is something that, um, and this is, this is the, the owners, the uh, system owners, the, those who are paying the bills, the uh, existing IT staff, um, and users uh, being able to commit to some kind of transition that allows them to put in some level of uh, additional security. Um, one of the, the we, we touched on data, and this is a big, this is a big kind of challenge. We have the technology today, and certainly those those are, have been around the IC and the and the DoD uh, for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we've been we've been working on solutions and have implemented solutions that allow you to the label data down to the cell cell level. So individual cells within databases, we can wrap that data, we can encrypt it, and we can we can put policy around that particular element. Um, the problem in most legacy systems is, uh, well, that data isn't sitting uh, in, a, in, a, in a database structure that allows for that level of, of policy down to the cell level, down to the individual data element. And sometimes when we look at data and we kind of are, are trying to kind of figure out what the protect service surface is uh, within our environments, and we think about complex systems, as uh, as Bill was mentioning before, data moves between different systems. Now we have major systems within the government today, uh, some of which have some really great, you know, um, cloud native uh, uh, pieces, and then on the back end they're running, uh, you know, as, as uh, mainframes with database and you know basically flat file database systems and. Uh, even you know pre-relational in some cases, um, so we have to think, and, and this is where I, I push. You know, we talked about uh, data. We talked about engineers and software. I think the other part of Zero Trust, of course, is the data stewards, uh, yeah. the data scientists, the, the data owners um, have to be part of this um, uh, this skill set and and this upping of skill set because in the end they've got to be in the position of tracking the life cycle of data throughout wherever it goes, right? And so you can't be, you're only as strong as your weakest link. If we build systems that it's like, yay, merrily, merrily, we have this great you know, system over here for authentication, and when the users are searching, it's all great. But on the back end, this thing is still relying on a, you know, a very flat database structure with, with no ability to provide uh, granular security controls, then we have a problem. So, so data is a big problem. Um, fear of impacting is another thing. So fear is a, a big factor. Those of you who've been through modernization efforts, you probably heard, at least I did in several cases, uh, if, you, if you implement that security change, people are going to die. Um, I don't know if you've heard that. I certainly heard that several times in my early career in government um, when we actually put in firewalls and, and went to um, uh, you know, uh, close by default and open by exception rules. Um, they were in sort of a medical environment. And the idea was if we did that, people would, would, would perish. Um, so you have that sort of fear. Now, I think we're coming to grips with the fact that security is important uh, today, and we've, we've had some big events. Um, but there's still the concern, OK, well, how does it imp impact? Uh, how does this change impact uh, our ability to, to search in the existing system or, or to do our, you know, it's already an, a legacy system that runs a little bit slow. You know, what are you going to add on top of that? Now the great thing is there's great technologists and companies here on the floor that, have, that are solving those problems and that have uh, solutions that are, aren't as um, uh, aren't going to cause additional uh, uh, problems for systems. But you got to have that communication uh, with your your customers and, and have them understand um, that you know get through the fear. Now we also talked about gaps in technology. Um, 
there's going to be, not only do we have sort of the, the legacy problem uh, on our hands with different types of security policy, different types of identity uh, systems, uh, different ways of authenticating users, but we also have kind of a fear now that everyone's going to go out and kind of do their own thing within uh, enterprise with, with zero trust, and we're going to wind up with this heterogeneous zero trust solution, which isn't really a, a zero trust solution. So as identities are moving around laterally in networks and accessing uh, resources that we, we don't have, we don't play well together. So there's this, certainly, uh, even in this, in this journey away from um, uh, where we, we are today, we have to be careful that we don't all go out and buy something because we saw that you know a, a vendor added to their website Zero Trust and they're now a Zero Trust company. Um, and then the last thing, we talked about training and, and I, mentioned, I mentioned training is still one of those uh, those mo major barriers, um, you know, to, to get your existing staff over. Um, but, you know, again, bringing in, this is a big tent problem, so it's no longer technology. You're no longer going to hand it off to, to poor Glenn as a CISO and say, you know, solve this or the CIO and solve this. Um, it's, it involves, involves data scientists, involves data stewards, data owners, as much as it does the technologists. we got to train everybody up on, on, on their part. Um, and then last thing is, is visibility, and we, we touched on this as well, but this is a huge problem in legacy systems. Um, the visibility that we have, now this, I, I'll say this is a bigger problem in much of the civilian government, less so in the IC and the DOD, we'll say, but um, legacy systems, we have a, we have a, uh, most, most system owners don't have a good sense of the, so that east-west traffic between systems. They don't really understand the ports and protocols and, the, and what's actually happening in terms of data transfer and the life cycle of data. And this is going to be a, this is a big part of, as we, as, as you start to build your strategy around zero trust is, is, is that, that accounting for what's happening and taking, um, uh, you know, a analyzing traffic, analyzing who has access to what, how much of your data is actually just open to everybody, how much is it, um, that's, having that visibility is important. Again, there's, there's great solutions today for that. That's a solved, let's say solved technical problem in the sense that we know how to do this. We know how to um, track telemetry uh, between systems, uh, even in legacy systems. But that's something that has to get done because you can't write policy around something that you don't understand. Um, and then you know, to the la last point I'll make on that is that we can't protect everything. And we said this before, you can't protect everything the same. Um, we really got to, uh, as, you, as you're examining the, those, that data within your system and, and, and communications, we have to decide what's most important and what really requires us to act now um, versus you know, the less important uh, uh, data and, and, and uh, resources within our network. So the, all that has to be understood. I just, I'll say that unfortunately in many environments, we, we know 10% of what we should about uh, the, the you know sort of those those basic uh, what I'll call the table stakes of zero trust. You know you gotta you got you gotta know. And I, I will mention that as government agencies have have always had this requirement. I mean, we've had this requirement for years to understand our data and what's important and then prioritize it. Um, I'll say that zero trust is kind of forcing us to really finish that work because it's uh, I, I'll say it's quite disparate uh, between agencies today. Can I add yeah. on? So I was going. I was. I saw Bill nodding. Yeah. So, so please. the the legacy is always going to be a challenge. A positive you could that I think will happen, and I wonder if will happen. I hope will happen, is that zero trust is explainable to everybody. It it should make sense to the people who are using your systems, and you who are running those systems, so that when you get to that question about policy de development, you're not just doing it for the IT to make the policy, you're doing it for the, your, your mission, your business objectives. And, and as such, you'll probably find motivations and other resources as you get to those conversations that you might not have felt when you were imposing something on people. You were, you were building the prison and you didn't know the prisoners. Well, now you're, you're building the playground, but you know what kind of games they want to play. And, and so that's the positive I hope we get from, from being consistent. I don't know what I ate for lunch, it's just kind of going crazy <laughs> here, but, but, but that's, you know, stick to the positive on this is, is I think it becomes more realizable. You can, you can start to tr picture the annual training if you have to do it, that they show you a little office and somebody picks up the phone and you give the wrong answer out or you click on that phishing link, 
now turn that into zero trust conversations. What was just violated there? What, what zero trust could have protected you after you made the mistake? That starts to become a little more interesting and you bring, you bring expertise up to the user level at the, at the different network stack. And, and we had been talking about organizational zero trust. One thing, or there's actually two things I want to remind folks about looking at this problem is that you also have third party and external parties, mission partners, that are also accessing some of your resources in the organization. So coming up with a mindset of how you're going to protect your organization from their compromise as well that ransomware and other threat actors are taking advantage of because they already find that the inherent defense and depth may be organizationally, but it's the third parties and the mission partners that you also have to pay attention, and also NPE, the non-person entities. It could be robots or data centers that don't have any humans behind it that are also accessing your resources within your organization that can impact your mission. So I want to build on that, um, and I'm glad Glenn mentioned it because I, I was going to get to it eventually, but we're talking interconnections, legacy interconnections at least, ISA, MOU, MOA, um, third parties or other government agencies, right, who are third party to you. Uh, and DOD IC slash civilian, there are many systems, I could just think of a, you know, export control, right, that, that you have DOD, State Department, Commerce, uh, DHS for sure, uh, which today is a whole collection of security controls, I'm sure, with all the separate ATOs and again, MOUs in there. Um, how does Zero Trust work with that uh, to, well, I'll leave it open for that. How does Zero Trust work with that uh, moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I'll throw it to the rest of the group after I make my comment, but from my perspective, not well. Think about <laughs> stoplights, think about water systems, think about energy, right, uh, that you probably don't pay attention to, but they're supplying you know, utilities to you in some way that let you live your life or your organization. Um, those entities that are operating at the device level may not even have a way to communicate uh, over software. And, and now those compromise uh, attack vectors are being looked at as the next things to attack. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what it, and I know this is something this is working with uh, uh, across DOD is, is trying to come up with even, you know, sort of common standards for our identity out to the tactical edge. I mean, everything from, you know, enterprise systems out to the tactical edge for all, um, parts of DOD, and as you mentioned, we've got the challenge of not just that, but there are data sets that, uh, and um, identities that we want to be able to pass between, as you said, DHS, um, uh, DOJ, and, and uh, energy and, and other organizations. Uh, so that comes into a, like a, you know, a, 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 it's a bigger problem. I don't, I don't know that we can, we, it's not an overnight solving the problem because it's a matter of like, you know, figuring out if you can, um, now we, we used to, in the IC, we were you know really heavily focused on data moving between um, uh, data, uh, going between agencies and being treated the same regardless of where it went. So it's wrapped with certain markers, you know, it's labeled and, and wrapped. It's it's encrypted. It's handed off to somebody else. Uh, has all the provenance and, and historic information with it. And does that data then get treated the same way when it's used in the next agency, uh, when it's out of your hands? Um, and then similarly, if, if you're an entity or you're, you're um, authenticated in, into a system and you're you know, transitioning between systems to do different things for different purposes, is that do systems um, respect you know, the same rules around your purpose? What are your labels? What are your attributes? Um, that's a, I mean, it's a hard problem. I, I think that's the, um, but um, not to discourage anyone, <laughs> we, we, that's not going to be one we, we, we solve um, before we can, we can um, create better uh, authentication systems. We, we, have a we have a language where we can, we can show the failures in, in a common language, so where it won't be able to be trusted, so that then you can make the risk mitigation decisions and go, that's okay, I can't do anything better than that, and it starts to point toward the gaps where research can then build onto it. So again, the optimist in me thinks it gives, it gives us a framework to communicate how far we can go today so that we, we're we honest with ourselves. We're not fooling ourselves anymore. No, it's been interesting to see how things have moved up. It used to be security, you talked about layer three or layer two or whatever or application. And now it's very much moved up the stack to, to data. And I think one of the positives is 
is the fact that we're kind of focusing on the right ideas of data and risk and things like that, rather than focusing on a particular protocol or a tool. I'll look at it that way. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we are coming up to a quarter to the hour, so I'm going to throw more questions to the group, and then we'll open it up to anyone who has questions in the audience. But last one here, when discussing, uh, and Glenn, I think we talked about this before, when discussing some of the strategies of our committee, of this ETS committee, how is this now a different approach than other things that we have done before? Yeah, so like I mentioned about the subcommittee, I saw this as cross-cutting different layers of the organization, even within AFSIA. So we're not focusing just on one sector, right? It's really about the behaviors and the culture that you have in the organization to achieve a mission. So I, I really see this topic as a mindset that can create change for the positive, right? To ensure their organizational operations. And so trying to think differently is, is what I see happening here. Uh, whereas before we tried to do it through controls uh, or through direct uh, interventions in policy, or even tell somebody you have to do this right now without really assessing the nth order dependencies uh, that that have that can have on the organization like third party. So, but I'm curious what the audience thinks, and um, and so last pitch on the subcommittee, it's it's open. It's not a member only type of committee. We're open to all voices uh, to learn from each other, and that was the whole goal, was to learn and share. So if you're interested in a subcommittee, uh, please give me your card, and I'll invite you to the next meeting. We have it every month, and we have uh, great guest speakers like um, Mr. Carone to come in and, and share their thoughts uh, about what's going on with Zero Trust, but um, I'm happy to have that conversation with you afterwards. Great, thank you. And the, the subcommittee is how many people, more or less, now? Well, I mean, over 100 are invited, but uh, really we, we just welcome the, the participation because you get out of it what you put into it. So for the folks that pretty much stand on the sidelines and just listen in, I'm pretty sure they're lear learning something that they didn't know before they attended. So in my mind, that's a success. Excellent, excellent. All right, so any questions, please? Yeah, yeah thank you. Tommy Gardner, uh, CTO at HP Federal. Uh, you've given a great discussion in a great presentation on zero trust from the principles of software, networks, and data. Uh, but they don't operate in isolation. They operate with hardware. And you, the whole principle of zero trust philosophy within the hardware uh, can be the most critical and most important part of a zero trust application. And so uh, you usually are using the hardware you're given. It's an initial condition. But if you back that up to the procurement decisions, now you have a difference. The hardware are not commodities. They're all designed different, and they're either designed with zero trust as an initial criteria of design or not. So can you comment on the hardware aspect of a zero trust application? And yes, I would like to join your committee. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Bill very quickly after I make this comment, but if you uh, look at Ron Ross, Dr. Ross's uh, publications on uh, 800 160 uh, which is really a hardware look of protecting organizations right absolutely it it really starts as early as possible in the generation of your infrastructure and and having that defense in depth at the hardware level obviously can deter a lot of attack vectors but you can't dismiss it so I, I agree with you having that inclusive of your mindset is an important factor uh, yes it's kind of that supply chain issue isn't it I mean uh, and we all you know are worried about that cloud provider who had the sh the computer shipped to them, the system shipped to them, that has that evil chip inside of it, aren't we, right? Or, or what you talk about, side channel attacks, all those things. Yeah. Well, it, it, what we build in the center, and when we document it, we're, we hopefully we'll be highlighting why this hardware gives you the advantage to let you enable it. And that will probably filter out that you won't be able to do it with a, with a, a carburetor anymore. You're going to need to have anti-lock brakes, you're going to need to have airbags. And, and that's going to be back to the modernization stuff that John was talking about. It's going to force modernization. So, so yes, and, and since they published 800-207, we've now grown into, oh crud, there are suppliers who can't protect, and now that adds to where does Zero Trust need to go back to? And, and, and that could be a use case in its own right. You're, you're a provider that provides connections and does updates. Okay, how do, I, how do I show that you've done something zero trust so now you can do more? CMMC, I think, is going to jump on that pretty big. And the, 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 not CM, yeah, the, the DOD CMMC. So I think, I think it gives us, again, the language 
the language to at least say functionally easier with this new stuff or the best stuff kind of, best stuff's not the right word for it. Yeah, but, but Zero Trust is not limited just to the user, it's also at the device level. So you still have to have that continuous monitoring uh, within your Zero Trust mindset that will observe inherent behaviors that are not uh, typical uh, of that device. So it's not, you're not depending on the, the, the equipment and, or the hardware itself. You also have another layer of monitoring about that to uh, flag it, its uh, conditions. I've also seen some, I can't hear you. Build it into the hardware. Oh, build yeah. it into the hardware, yes sir. You build in the hardware. I've seen some pretty sophisticated monitoring and zero trust stuff with, with legacy network equipment too. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a limiting factor. I, yeah, as, as I say, you know, zero trust is a newer term, but it, the technologies, oh, the I, techniques have been around for a very, very long, long time. time. I mean, if you, yeah. it, it depends how you look at it, if you look at port security on a switch, that, that's zero trust. You don't trust anyone to plug anything in, it right? Just, just okay. try to get to Windows 11. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going, next. <laughs> yes, sir, please. Hi, uh, my name is Frank Kidd. I'm a computer science teacher um, at Elinda Memorial High School in Houma, Louisiana. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, I know a lot of DOD standards trickle over to the civilian agencies. I'm a, I retired from the Department of Labor two years ago. So my first question is, do you think zero trust is going to eventually become a requirement at civilian agencies? My second question is, um, will universities that want to be a part of the new cyber consortium or work with DOD through other means, will they, all, will they need to have zero trust on their networks or at least a segment of their networks? So, yeah, so the, fir the, the answer to the first question is, um, it's often the other, the other way that question is asked, is DOD going to be required to do zero trust? Uh, so the, the zero trust, um, in terms of the uh, EO that came out from the president, that affects uh, the civilian agencies and, and critical infrastructure, um, that's its focus. And um, so it, it, starts, it starts there. Now, naturally, um, you know, NSA and DOD have come out with their, their approaches to, uh, to the problem as well. So this is a universal, uh, a universal challenge. It's, um, uh, it's protection of, of United States assets. And, and again, it's, it's not just even DOD and, and, and the civilian side uh, and the intelligence community. It's critical infrastructure, it's, it's uh, energy sector, it's uh, transportation sector, et cetera. Uh, and then all the contractors and companies sure. uh, supporting those, uh, those sectors. So I think uh, for sure that's, um, you know, and then in terms of technology um, use and sort of a, a, a across agencies, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that the civilian sector can learn from what's already been done uh, in the classified space with, within DOD and IC. Uh, and the civilian and the unclassified side of DOD can learn from those as well. That has to happen. Um, so there is, you know, that kind of requirement and, you know, as, as much as it can be unified, you know, again, you're, you're only as good as your weakest link. Um, and some of the great uh, hacks of our of our day have started with, uh, you know, not necessarily directly in government, but with, you know, contract networks connected to government and and uh, poor monitoring of that communication. Um, this has got to be a, a big tent. Everybody's, you know, kind of playing by the same rules and sharing intelligence and, and capability. I want to answer your question directly for resources. So zero trust.cyber.gov. It will have the uh, CISO framework uh, for the reference architecture, the maturity model, and the uh, more details on the executive order that John was talking about. Go to the DOD reference architecture as well. They have a reference architecture that you can look at. And then there's probably another one that's also important is the uh, ICAM uh, strategy because uh, without the identity governance uh, within Zero Trust, you really don't have that component working very well unless you have a way to identify and, and credential the users uh, on that are accessing the resources. So ICAM, the DOD reference architecture, the system model, and at zerotrust.cyber.gov. And I kind of wondered, James, is CompTIA, high school kids get Security Plus often. Is Security Plus in, in the, it's always being reviewed and updated perhaps, is Zero Trust architecture language? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's been in there for some time. We've seen, we saw it first to enter uh, into Network Plus years ago. Uh, that's one other thing that's important to understand is that, uh, uh, for example, CompTIA certs are industry driven, right? There are thousands of people who 
who weigh in on each of those. My point being that the first people who implemented zero trust uh, were organizations, for example, Google. They did that years ago. It took them about a total of seven years. And what I find interesting here is that we have, with the resources that you outlined, uh, they kind of articulating and documenting what zero trust is. A lot of industry, when they implemented it, they, didn't, they weren't even calling it zero trust at that point, and they started calling it zero trust. They didn't really document that for the world to see, but now that it's moved into the government, it's now being documented. So I'd like to point that out. And we've seen various skills, whether it be from single sign-on, micro-segmentation, understanding of monitoring, uh, data classification. We're doing a lot with data at CompTIA now. Uh, we've seen that movement up the stack. Uh, all those things have, have moved in uh, and are very important job, uh, job roles. So it's interesting to see uh, over the years, it's been a, something over about a decade that I've noticed anyway. It's been a trend. Yeah, just the, oh, was there another question? Please. They didn't specifically um, answer the second question about universities, but I'm going to assume that the answer to that question is going to be yes. If yes. a university wants to work with DOD, they'll probably need that. Yeah. So uh, there's an event in January, it's called Cyber Education Research Tracing Symposium. Sir. It's sponsored by AFC. It's going to be in Augusta, Georgia at Fort Gordon, right? And that event, I think we're in our fourth or third instance of it, but that focuses strictly on the, the workforce and education components of, of cyber, and we're going to have a joint focus on that, but uh, that's another event you want to probably look into because we're going to invite universities and acad uh, academic institutions, companies that really support the institutions in learning about what skill sets they need in reskilling, uh, upskilling, and really help uh, really the future of the workforce that are currently uh, going through secondary school really look at jobs in the future. Yeah, it's certs Augusta. In fact, we're hitting a, a two-hour session on data security. Specifically, we're bringing in data workers as well as security workers and kind of having a nexus with that. So. I can't. We didn't hear the question. Uh, uh, look it up. It's AFCIA CERTS, C-E-R-T-S. Uh, the name CERTS. of the conference is called CERTS, C-E-R-T-S. Cybersecurity Education Research Training, training symposium. symposium. Training Symposium. January 25, 27. That's right. In Augusta, Georgia. In Augusta. And they're doing it online, too, aren't they? I don't know about online. Pretty but sure. We, yeah. We're trying to have it in person, if and possible. An, another uh, quick FCA plug, because we're running out of time, is uh, the December issue of Signal is going to be all about our favorite subject. I think we've had Zero Trust mentioned in every, ep, every, ep, uh, every, every Signal issue. this year, probably. Yeah. But... Uh, December is all about zero trust. I think some of us will have a, a little piece of that, um, some, some of our material in there. Um, but uh, please check that out and uh, please join us. Can I, can I quick, uh, quick thanks to Dan uh, for being our moderator and our, uh, my fellow colleagues. I, I really appreciated uh, the opportunity to share with you. I know we didn't answer all your questions today, but I'm, I'm going to be here. Hopefully my colleagues are. If you have other questions, want to join subcommittee, uh, please be welcome to join us. And thank you so much uh, for coming, Dan. Yes, I would like to uh, express my appreciation as well for the group. Uh, yes, this is a little group because we all know each other, but this is how we work together. We get a lot of good information out. Uh, and please, the more the merrier. Uh, this is, you know, again, Glenn is the chair, but I'm happy to sign him up to get more people in there. Um, and uh, with that, I, I appreciate, uh, if there are no other questions, I appreciate everyone, uh, everyone joining us today. Oh, one, one more question? question? One more question? Shabu Thomas from the Force Point. Um, just a quick question on your thoughts on how continuous evaluation fits into the zero trust the whole the framework the methodology always. always always right so so like <laughs> those Sorry. data source when those data how are those data sources getting pulled in and then enacted into the into the framework what's the ideal way yeah we can talk to you afterwards yeah. uh, of how we uh, look at that but you're welcome to join yeah. the subcommittee and, and discuss your approaches you. yeah it's a great question yeah thank you gentlemen thank you again and we will be here if anyone needs anything thanks again